Hello, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi, joined live today by Dr. Andrew Loke. What we're doing is reviewing a an exchange. It started out as a written exchange. It kind of turned into a video exchange, but then ended in a, in a written exchange between Dr. Andrew Loke and Dr. Richard Carrier. Richard Carrier, if you don't know, he's a probably most well known for his views on uh, Jesus mythicism. So he doesn't believe that uh, Jesus actually existed in history, uh, but he also every now and then he'll sort of pontificate on philosophical things like related to apologetics. So like the different arguments for God's existence and fine tuning, and he'll share his thoughts there, uh, even though his PhD was in history. And uh, so, so he, he nevertheless has an interest in those topics. And so he'll talk about those every now and then. And so recently he took a look at Dr. Andrew Loke's work on the cosmological argument, and then he provided some feedback there. And Dr. Loke, uh, if you guys don't know who Dr. Loke is, he's a, a PhD scholar living in Hong Kong. He's written several books on the cosmological argument, fine tuning, uh, even the, the resurrection of Jesus. Very, very interesting, good stuff. But Dr. Loke, um, if you don't, if you're not familiar with what he does or how he sort of operates online, if someone responds to something that he puts out, he will normally spend time responding to them regardless of, you know, whether or not they've got a PhD or, or any sort of merit or anything, uh, which is separate from like what he does actually like on these online in-person debates or anything like that. But uh, Dr. Carrier, I think, um, and, and Andrew, you, you seem to uh, agree with this, that he deserved a response. Some of the things that he was responding to your work about. So what we're doing in this show is we've got Dr. Loke on. He's going to sort of summarize the exchange between them so that one one of the hopes with this show is that you're going to better understand the cosmological argument and the, the sort of advancements that have been made in the work on the cosmological argument uh, through the work of someone like Dr. Loke. Um, because since, I mean, a lot of people are familiar with like you know, people like Dr. William Lane Craig, who have done a lot of really good work on the Kalam cosmological argument, other ar arguments for the existence of God. Um, but his work on those arguments was primarily done back in like the 80s, 90s, um, even in the 2000s. But a lot of progress has been made since then. And so someone like Dr. Loke has made some of those advancements and tried to to forward the dialectic that way. So w that's part of the the aim for today is to to help you guys, the audience, better understand some of the advancements that have been going on in these arguments. And then these interactions from Dr. Uh, Carrier, he's going to provide some skeptical pushback. And so Dr. Loke is going to be interacting with that, providing a sort of summary. And, and hopefully you guys will take away, have a better understanding of how the argument works, how it might be defended, how it might be objected to, and all those sorts of things. So um, one last thing before I bring Dr. Loke in here is that with the exchange between Dr. Carrier um, and Dr. Loke, I haven't actually read the full exchange between the two of them. That was on purpose because I want to, uh, as Dr. Loke is sort of summarizing and giving his his thoughts on this, I want to try to help the audience. If there's anything that's sort of unclear, I want to to help you guys and myself understand uh, the sort of complexities that are that are going on here. So I'll be basically joining this conversation as an audience member, almost like you guys are. So uh, just a, a, something to, to note a little bit different. But Dr. Loke, it's, uh, it's great to have you back here. I'm, I'm excited to, to dive into the show today. Yes, it's great to speak to you, uh, Cameron, today. All right, yeah, let's just uh, jump right in. You've got some slides prepared for us, so feel free to pull those up. Um, or if there's anything else that you'd like to say before we get to those slides, feel free to, to do that now. Yeah, so let me just begin by giving a brief overview of the background of my exchange with Dr. Carrier. So it began with uh, him uh, writing an article back in October 2023, criticizing my book, The Theological and Kalam Cosmological Arguments Revisited. Right, so that book was uh, published by Springer Nature, a peer review academic publisher. Um, in 2022, and uh, it uh, engaged with some of Carrier's arguments. So he wrote a reply uh, to that book, uh, criticizing my book. And I wrote a reply to him, pointing out 20 errors in his criticisms. And a PhD student, uh, Nathan Bray at uh, St. Andrews University, he saw my reply to Carrier and thought that it would be good to bring me and him for a private online forum where we discuss our views in front of other professors. Uh, other professional professional philosophers. And uh, during the forum, uh, all of us disagreed with Carrier, actually, those of us who contributed and we raised objections to his view. And after the forum, Carrier wrote a long article giving further elaboration of his view and criticizing my view. And I wrote a reply, pointing out 40 errors in his uh, latest uh, reply. And 
Uh, after that, he posts a comment on his blog saying that uh, he's not good, bo bo bothering. He's not bothering to read my latest reply because he thinks that it is too long, what twelve thousand words, and he claimed that I said nothing worth replying to last time. Okay, so so that's the end of our exchange, right? He he says he's not going to reply anymore. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, um, you know, his comment on my last reply is uh, not uh, accurate, also because. Uh, he failed to note that actually one third of my 12,000 words is actually in the appendix, which is actually containing my first response to him, right? Which he had already supposedly read. And uh, about one third of the rem remaining uh, words is actually Carrier's own statements, which I quoted and then replied to. And so my own words in the second reply is only approximately 6,000 words, which is about the same length as his, art his uh, last article of 6,000 words. And so it, it is not much longer, actually, than his um, final article. And moreover, no, his, his claim that uh, I said nothing worth replying to previously, I think, is based on, um, I think the problem is that, as I showed in my, uh, I showed by the 60 errors which I have identified in his writings, uh, Carrier doesn't actually understand basic logic and modal logic, as well as metaphysics. Uh, he doesn't uh, know how to read properly and represent the views of other scholars properly. And so given you know, his failure to do so, it's not surprising that uh, he thought that I said nothing worth replying to. Uh, but anyway, we'll be going through some, some of the errors, uh, some of his errors uh, in our discussion today. And I hope that you'll post the links to his articles and my responses in the description of this video. Yeah, so the one that I've got now, and I, I can add any, any that you'd like to send me, I've got the link to your uh, academia article where you're responding to I believe his uh, his longer blog post, but um, I did I did also want you want to mention that the, although you highlight sixty errors that he's made in his responses to your work, uh, we're we're not going through all sixty in in this video. We're going to uh, be be looking at the highlights. So you guys can, if you'd like to see all sixty errors, you can go to the actual links in the description of the video. But that's not what we're doing here. We're just going to be looking at the highlights, the, the 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 most important parts. So that's what we'll be doing today. Okay, great. Yes. So let me start by, first of all, um, introducing my uh, modus totus argument, because that is the argument that he's targeting right, in his criticism. Um, all right, so let me share my screen. Yep. Take a sweet coffee. There slide. you go. Uh, it's, it's popping up. There it is. Uh, let me get it on the screen here. Okay. There we go. Yep, just uh, make it full screen. We'll be able to see it. Yes, uh, it's already full screen. All right. Uh, so uh, this argument uh, is an argument which I have defended on your channel a few times in my debate mm -hmm. with Graham Op and also with uh, Daniel Linford. Uh, and this uh, is also real the quick, that, uh, real quick, Doctor Lo, can you can you hit the present button so that way it's it's uh, it takes up the the whole screen because it's it's large, but we oh. can see it a little bit better if you hit present. Oh yes. Oh yeah. That's right. Um, hmm. It looks like it's uh, it's gone away. There we okay, go. Is it full yeah, screen just, now? Uh, no, it's if you just hit present, it should be a uh, full screen. I, I hit I did hit present. I, I hit slash okay. show. Hmm. Yeah, it's still not full screen. Um, although I think I think people can still see it, so uh, it might be okay to just uh, to to move through it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so basically, um, as we all know, if an argument is deductively valid and the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Uh, the conclusion is true, right? This follows from the laws of logic. And the modus students argument is a deductively valid uh, form. Right? If P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. And so uh, my argument goes like this. If something, say, for example, X begins on cause, then some other particular things, such as Y, which began or could begin to exist around us, would also begin on cause because uh, if something begins on cause, that, that means that there will be no cause, which makes it the case that only X rather than Y begins on cause. And moreover, the properties of X and the properties of Y, which differentiate between them in the concrete world, uh, this differentiation uh, it will only be had by X and Y when they have already begun to exist. And therefore, this implies that there will be no difference between X and Y where beginning to exist on cause is concerned, given that the circumstance around us is compatible with the beginning of Y. It doesn't prevent uh, the existence of Y. And so uh, 
we, we would expect to see Y also beginning to exist uncaused if X begins uncaused. However, it is not the case that Y begins uncaused. Right? So for example, we don't experience a sudden increasing in strength of electric field around, uh, beginning uncaused around us and killing us. And moreover, we also don't see another universe you know, beginning to exist uncaused and crashing into our universe, for example. Right? We don't see such things happening. And therefore, uh, it is not the case that X begins uncaused. Right? This follows from modus tonus. And so this implies that whatever begins to exist has a cause. In fact, whatever begins to exist, begin to exist will depend on the cause to be the case that it is X rather than Y that begin to exist. Right? So, so this is the modus uh, tollens argument for the causal principle. I wonder, would you mind if I uh, ask you a question on this? So th there's a, a version sure. of this argument uh, th that I've read in uh, Necessary Existence that was co-authored by Josh Rasmussen and Alexander Proust. They've got an argument, I think they call it the argument from chaos. I can't remember the exact name. That, that may be yeah. actually the, the exact name that they use. Um, but basically, the argument that they use is that um, suppose that something can begin to exist uncaused. Now, the question would be, what sort of amount of things could fit into that category? So there's a category column, things that can begin to exist uncaused. OK, that category either like if you think that something can begin uncaused, you got to believe that there's at least one thing that that can fit into that category. But then the question would be how many things would actually be in that category? And there's not really a reason to limit it. There's not there's no reason to think that only one thing could exist uncaused. So you'd probably have to believe that that set of things that can begin to exist uncaused is like infinitely large. And then this, the, the next step in their argument is to say, uh, if that set of things is infinitely large, then we would actually expect to find things popping into existence uncaused out of nothing um, all the time because that set is is so large and there's, you know, it doesn't discriminate of, of like different times of when it comes into existence or anything like that. So th that that's um, maybe, maybe I don't get all the details right there, but that's sort of a summary. It seems like it's actually... Uh, pretty consistent with uh, what you argue here in your Modus Tollens argument. I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that. Yes, uh, yeah, the, the argument is uh, um, pretty similar to mine. Um, but uh, no, I, I read the argument quite a while ago, so I can't remember the details now. Um, and I am not actually prepared to discuss the argument uh, today. Uh, but if I remember correctly, I think the argument um, is based on certain idea of uh, wh whether something can begin to exist uncaused. Um, mm -hmm. And if something can begin to exist uncaused, other things would, uh, can also begin to exist uncaused. Uh, now, however, my, my argument, the way I formulate it, is not based on what can or cannot happen, but what would happen, right? Uh, so I'm saying that if something did begin uncaused, then other things would begin to exist uncaused around us. Um, so uh, the way I formulate it actually makes it uh, resistant to some other objections which has been raised against mm -hmm. um, that uh, you, you are arguing from, from Ken or, or could uh, um, uh, the objections that have been raised by Amida and, uh, and others uh, which I discuss uh, in, mm -hmm. in, in my book, yes. Yeah, I think I think their argument is is compatible with the the sense that you use it here, where they're they're just saying they're, it's almost like a stipulating if there is if that set is not empty, then it would be infinite, and so that that would be the sort of conditional premise that they would defend, and then from there the argument can kind of go through, and so then they would just argue, you know, that the the antecedent there is false, the the uh, the category is empty, uh, because they're they're you know if it wasn't empty, then there would be you know, things popping into existence all the time, but that doesn't happen. So, um, the antecedent is false, but, but yeah, anyways, there, there are some similarities, some differences, but, um, I think yeah. the, the takeaway here though, is that, um, it, and I think this is also related to Dr. Craig's work where he argues, I think it, it, is it the second argument that he uses in defense of his causal principle that, you know, yes. and this is the quote where, you know, root beer, why don't we see root beer and Eskimo villages pop into existence and cause? It seems like if one thing can come into existence and cause, then uh, other things would follow suit, but that doesn't happen. So, um, or that wouldn't happen. And so. Yeah. So um, some, some, some people have objected to his formulation by saying that uh, his argument only goes to show that uh, other things could, can begin to exist and cause around us, but it doesn't mean that they would. And so uh, it, it might just be the case that they didn't right, happen, begin uncaused around us. So, so that is one objection that you know, some people have raised against Craig's formulation. But as I say, my, my formulation is not about could, right, but it's about would. Right? So I, I showed that they think we would see 
things uh, begin to exist on cause around us if something did begin to exist on cause but uh, that that's not mm. the case right yeah mm. all right let's uh, let's move forward okay all right so uh now i'm going to address uh, carrier's latest response um to my argument so this is okay so let me share another screen for him Mm -hmm. And the, you're pulling up right now uh, his website, right? His his website where he replies to the video conversation that you guys had, the private video conversation. Yes, and also to uh, to my first reply as well. So this is his uh, most recent, right? Um, response his most recent and, and his final one. Uh, I, I mean, he, he said he's gonna he's not gonna reply anymore, right? I mean, that, that's that's yeah. what he said uh, in the blog post. But I, I don't know, he may change his mind later on. Uh, I, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, this is his latest reply. Yeah. All right. So what do we okay, need to know about this one? Yeah, it's, it's okay. already up and, and everyone can see it. That's good. All right. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I'm just going to summarize. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go through some of the important points and point out why the points they make are erroneous. But I would like to uh, begin by highlighting something which I find is the most shocking <laughs> in uh, this uh, on this page, actually. Um, actually, the most shocking thing I find is not written by Carrier himself. It was actually something that I found in the, the comment section, right? So this is the first comment. Uh, somebody has written this. Uh, you know, he says, impeccably argued. <laughs> Do you see that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I, I find that to be the most shocking thing. Why? Because um, honestly, I think this is Carrier's article is really the worst uh, article I've ever seen written by anyone on the column cosmological uh, any, on anything related to the column argument actually, uh, because uh, almost every paragraph <laughs> contains an error, as uh, we will go through later. Right, I, I will go through some of that later. Right, but um, I'm, I'm just so shocked that you know there are some of his uh, followers you know, who who just um, <laughs> it's like almost blindly uh, reading uh, following his views, but not actually uh, critical enough. Right to and, and sharp enough to notice that uh, there are so many things that is wrong with uh, what he says in this article. Okay, so let me go through some of them. Okay, let's start from the beginning. All right, so um, I will start from the section where he provides a summary of a debate. Right, do you see that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, so he 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 claims that uh, the debate was a route. Look, completely failed to defend his central proposition that if the causal principle had ever failed to operate, then we should still observe its failure to operate now. I demonst I demonstrated the opposite is the case. It will fail to operate only when no entity exists to manifest it, and we are not in that condition anymore. Um. Okay, so what he's saying, so basically his view is, Carrier's view is that um, in the initial, um, th th there, was there was nothing initially, right? There was absence of anything initially. And so not, not even the causal principle was there operating at, at the beginning. And so given that uh, there was nothing, right? No, no causal principle, nothing. A multiverse, a infinite multiverse will begin to exist from nothing, right? Uh, because there's no causal principle operating that prevent that from happening, and so that in essentially right, is uh, Carrier's uh, view, uh, view, right? That's what he, he's trying to argue for, and he, he claimed that. Um, I now, can you can I can I ask you a clarifying a clarifying question? Because that would seem to me like it, it would imply that he thinks that the causal principle is a contingent principle, that it's a principle that only holds you know at certain times in the universe, and it's not a metaphysically necessary. Principle and, and from what from what I understand, I mean, obviously, I'm not an expert in this, but it it seems to me like most people, most philosophers that argue in defense of a causal principle are defending something that they take to be metaphysically necessary, as opposed to say, you know, contingently true at, at certain times in the universe, and then false at, at other times. This is a very good question, and I will answer this question actually later on when we go through the discussion on contingency and necessity, because I think there are some confusions here. Uh, in fact, Carrier also makes some confusions regarding these issues. Yeah, so so I will I will I will answer your question later on as we move go along. Yeah. Okay. Okay, but uh, yeah, but at this point in time, I just want to highlight that uh, what Carrier stated is a misrepresentation, right? Uh, because I did not say 
that if the causal principle had ever failed to operate, right, then we should still observe its failure to operate. No, I, I never used the idea of fa failing to operate. Right, that that is what carrier put into my mouth. Right, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I I didn't put it in in that in that way. Right, um, because no, because right, rather what I said was if something X began uncaused, then Y, which began to, or could begin to exist around us, would also begin to exist uncaused. That's how I put it. Um, so I, I think it is false to think in terms of operating or governed by causal principle, a term that he used, uh, as we will see later on. Uh, so uh, he, 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 he seems to think about the, of the causal principle as um, something that is uh, governing right, um, how things operate or, 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 or mm -hmm. operating in a, in a way. Right? But I, I think you know, it, is, uh, it is false to, to think in, in these terms. Why? Because on my view, uh, I, I think the principle is merely a way of describing the fact that in our actual world, Things happen one way rather than the other as the result of concrete entities and their properties. So this means that I think it's the concrete entity, this is it is the concrete entities that is doing the metaphysical work, right? Um, and, and the causal principle is not a concrete entity, right? It's not something concrete there controlling anything. Uh, you can think of it as an abstract principle um, that, that describes how things uh, that, that whatever begins to exist uh, has a cause. Uh, and so, but on my view, right, uh, it is the concrete entities which are doing the metaphysical work, which means that without concrete causes, which means that without concrete causes to do the work of making things happen, there will, there will not be anything that will begin to exist, right? And therefore, mm. in our actual world, something does not come from nothing. Uh, this is not because there is a causal principle governing nothingness or operating. Rather, it is because in the absence of anything, right? there will be, uh, including the absence of concrete causes, indeed the absence of any potential to bring about something, there'll be no potential for something to begin to exist, right? Um, and so, so uh, the, this is uh, my view and- the, the Well, that's, that's a very good, that's a really good clarification. And I, I wanted to ask you, what, what, what would you uh, say is the name of that view? Cause, and how would you contrast it with uh, something like Carrier's view? Would you describe it? I, I, I think uh, Dr. Rob Coons, he's been on the channel a bunch. I, I think he calls it like a powers view of metaphysics. Is that is that the right term? Yeah, so um, it depends on how you characterize causes, right? So you can talk about causes in terms of powers, or you can talk about it in terms of dispositions. I, I, I like the term dispositions. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's similar to powers in a way, right? So uh, I, I discuss uh, this in detail in chapter three two and three of my book. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you, you, you can, you can call, call these powers or dispositions. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then how would you characterize uh carrier's view where he thinks that it's, uh, these laws are sort of, uh, almost like they're, they're doing things. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I can't remember that there is a, there is a name, name for this. Yes. Um, but anyway, anyway, I I think that that view is not warranted. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I, well, the reason why I was asking about the the names of it just because it's it's a little bit easier to like at least in my mind it's easier to have a name for a view and then be like okay this view is more plausible than this view. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I, I think I've I've also. Uh, been drawn toward the view that, that you outline here as well. And I think that actually makes a lot of sense, especially when we're thinking about, you know, what happened at the beginning of the universe? How did something come into existence? And then it also does make sense of the objection that like before, you know, prior to the Big Bang, there was nothing there that could have done anything. And so, and, and there were some people like, I think Dr. Richard Carey and even other uh, atheists online, and, and they, they've said similar things like if there is nothing there there's nothing constraining it from or, or preventing it from you know producing something uh, but on your view you're like no that you don't get something unless you already have something else there that has the capability of producing it because if you don't have that then you'd literally just have nothing it's not like you have these laws that just like come into existence or pop out of existence or you know it's it's almost like those are just kind of sort of these magical principles that pop into and out of existence whereas your view it's more it's almost to me it's almost like it's more grounded in 
reality. Like you've got to have something there. Yeah. In our case as theists, you know, we think that God is a metaphysically necessary being. And so he's the explanation for why these other things yeah. come into existence. But if you don't have anything yeah. on your view, on this powers view, if you don't, if there's nothing there, then you're not going to get something. You're not going to get a universe that is 13.7 billion years old or how old, however old it actually is. So, um, yeah, I think that that's a really interesting way of, yeah, uh, of right. thinking about it and good, good clarification there at the beginning too. Yeah, thank you. Yes, and the the, the truth of, the, of my view, the conclusion that something does not come from nothing is demonstrated by my Buddhist Thomas arguments, right? So what I'm saying is that, on the contrary, if something does come from nothing, um, as Carrier postulates, uh, then we would see other things coming from nothing around us as well, right? But that's not the case, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so so I'm, I'm going to explain later on that Carrier has not, in fact, rebutted my Buddhist Thomas argument at all, right? He is just assuming that in order for a causal principle to work, uh, it has to be, there must already be something, uh, you know, the causal principle must be operating, right? In that sense, that, that is his assumption, which I, I have already argued, no, we, 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 that, we, that, that assumption is not warranted. Yes. All right, yeah, let's, okay, uh, so, let's continue. And so what I'm saying is that, yeah. And so uh, in other words, right, what I'm arguing is that one can say that the causal principle is a true statement, right? Um, without saying that it's something that governing or operating, you know, it's, it's just a true statement. It's a statement that describes reality um, truly. And if you're a Platonist, you might think that the causal principle is an abstract entity, exists timelessly. If you are a nominalist, you can deny this and say that there's no causal principle existing in the condition of nothingness. But uh, both views are compatible with my argument, right? Um, in any case, uh, so my, my argument mm -hmm. doesn't need to presuppose Platonism or nominalism. You know, it is compatible with either one. Or God's and, existence. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, and I also want to clarify that uh, we we can make true statements about nothing, right? We can make true statements. In fact, Carrier himself claimed to be making many statements about nothing as well, isn't it? He claimed that uh, when there's nothing, right, something would come from it, right, the multiverse. Uh, so, um, so we we can make true statements um, uh, about uh, absence of anything and. For example, where we can say that in the absence of anything, it is true that whatever begins to exist would require a cause, right, as demonstrated by my modus tonus argument. And the, the, this true statement doesn't govern anything, right, since it merely, it merely describes what is the case. As I said, what makes things happen are concrete things. It is therefore a true statement that in the absence of concrete things, nothing will happen. And therefore, um, carriers claim that it is logically necessary that uh, in such a condition where nothing exists and infinite multiple infinite multiverse will result is actually false, right? Because uh, the falsity of his view is actually demonstrated by my modus tollens argument. Yeah. Okay. Um, is it everything clear so far? Yeah. Okay. And I also want to highlight something else that is wrong about um, his his view. Um, Carrier focuses. No, so no, just now, as uh, you, you heard, no, Carrier claimed that uh, the causal principle will fail to operate only when no entity exists to manifest it. And we are not in that condition anymore. Now, now that there is, there is something, right? Uh, we are no longer in the condition of nothingness. So Carrier is focusing on the condition of nothingness and saying that that condition no longer exists now. However, he fails to consider the things that are in existence now and asking whether their beginning of existence, whether their beginning of existence requires causally necessary conditions. Now, my argument is that if the beginning of X, something that exists now, does not require causes, and the difference between X and Y will only begin to exist after they already begun to exist, then the beginning of Y would also not require cause and therefore would likewise begin to exist uncaused around us, given that the present circumstance around us does not prevent their being of existence. So in other words, Carrier has actually failed to consider the reasons, the three reasons, right, which I gave for premise one of my argument. No, he, he just focused on the fact that uh, now there is something, right? Um, but he doesn't rebut uh, the three reasons which I've given for premise one, and therefore he has failed to rebut my argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another thought that just crossed my mind is that <clears throat> on his view, when you've got a state of nothingness, then there there's no causal principle that's going to prevent something from coming into existence uncaused. And then he says, once you have, once that state is no longer there, like once you have something, then it's not like that scenario is no longer possible. But I think that that 
is a non sequitur. Like just because there was a, you know, a, a state of nothingness, there was no causal principle, and then something came out of nothing. It doesn't follow from that, that once you have a state of something, that that causal principle no longer holds or that the causal principle is now in place. Like that doesn't follow at all. I think what he's kind of doing is seeing that <clears throat> just like the, I think it's the second premise of your argument, there aren't uncaused things that come into existence uncaused. And so he's sort of almost retroactively looking at that and being like, well, what that means is that at that period, then it switched to a, it switched to a case that the causal principle is now in place once something began to exist. Uh, but that doesn't follow. Like you could still, you could have a state, you know, a, a time when the causal principle was false, when there was a state of nothingness. And then that causal principle would just remain to be false after something exists. So it doesn't seem like he's given any sort of reason, at least not here. And maybe, maybe he does elsewhere. It doesn't seem like he's given some sort of reason to think that the causal principle would just suddenly be true once something begins to exist. Because yeah, if something can exist, can come into existence uncaused, um, just because something exists, that doesn't mean that other things can't come into existence uncaused. So it doesn't necessarily follow from the fact that something exists that the causal principle is true. You've got to reach that on, yeah, on other grounds. Yes, I, I think he may reply to your um, objection by saying that uh, once there is something, uh, the causal principle also begins to exist as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so because his view is that uh, when, there, when there was nothing, uh, an infinite multiverse, in fact, an infinite number of possible things would come out from nothing. That, that is his view. So, and that uh, would, in, the infinite amount of things would include the causal principle, which also began and cost. And once there is a causal principle, we, we will see things uh, beginning requiring a cost. I think that that is how he might reply to your objection. But it doesn't. But his his reply doesn't rebut my argument. Uh, he doesn't rebut my motor solvents arguments as as really explained. Yeah, but I also don't see how it responds to to my concern either. So <laughs> okay, but yeah, let's yes. uh, yeah, let's uh, let's move on. Let's let's get to another highlight uh, from from okay. Curio's response here. All right. Yeah, so uh, we can read the next sentence. Um, you know, he because he also claims that um, okay in the next sentence, Locke completely failed to explain how a causal principle can exist when nothing exists, as not even principles will exist. So he was contradicting himself, and he also failed to explain how if the universe began to exist and nothing else exists at the time, the universe even could have a cause, much less had to have a cause. Causes cannot precede themselves. Okay, so um, now concerning the first sentence, um, he, he claimed that uh, I contradict myself, but actually on, on my view, there's no contradiction because um, on my view and on the thesis view, there is always something existing, right? Namely God, right? So as you said just now, right? There is always something, yeah. a, a concrete entity there, God. And so my, my view is not contradictory. Uh, on the other hand, um, I already explained, my modus tonus argument actually shows that uh, um, if something X begins uncaused, um, then other things would uh, also begin uncaused around us, which is not the case, and therefore Carrot's claim is false. And so my argument does not require explaining how the causal principle can exist when nothing exists, right? contrary to what he claims. Rather, my modus argument demonstrates what would be the consequence if nothing, not even the causal principle, existed and multiverse came from nothing. And showing that this consequence is contrary to our to, is contrary to our observation, and therefore Carrier's claim is false. Now, um, Carrier also claimed that I failed to explain how, um, if the universe began to exist, the universe could even have a cause, and he because uh, he, he assuming that cause, um, uh, because uh, he 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 is saying that no causes cannot precede themselves. Now, actually, um, his objection is also another misrepresentation because um, he failed to consider my explanation in chapter six of my book, which he has supposedly read, right, that I have explained how the universe can have a beginning, beginningless cause, right, in the sense that if the beginningless timeless cause does not exist, the universe will not have begun to exist. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I already explained that, right, um, in chapter six of my book. Yeah, so he didn't reply to that. Okay, um, now Carrier also then go, later goes on to claim that um, it is self-contradictory to propose that the causal principle has to be caused. Now, again, this is another misrepresentation. 
I did not propose that the causal principle has to be caused or that the causal principle comes into existence, but rather, as I already explained, the causal principle is just the consequence of my view that in our actual world, things happen one way rather than the other as the result of concrete entities. Right? So I'm not claiming that uh, God created mm -hmm. the causal principle or, or no, I'm not saying that. Okay, now the next thing I want to discuss is about contingency, right? the issue of uh, which uh, you mentioned uh, just now. Okay, um, so, okay, Carrier argues that You might, might want to scroll down just a little bit. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay, scroll down a bit. <clears throat> okay, so Carrier says here that one might try to argue that it is logically impossible for the causal principle not to hold, but Locke rejected that approach, admitting that it is not a logically necessary principle. Um, yes, I am not claiming that the causal principle uh, is a logically princ necessary principle. And, and then he, he, but he then goes on to draw the conclusion that uh, since it is not logically necessary, it is therefore contingent. It therefore, it, it therefore is a cause. Now, I think there is another error here. Uh, why? Because contingent doesn't mean that, contingency doesn't mean that it needs a cause. Rather, contingent just means that it is true by virtue of the way things in fact are and not by logical necessity. That is, is true by virtue of the fact that, as I say, in our actual world, things happen one way rather than the other as the result of concrete entities and their properties. This is by virtue of the way things are. You know, this is talking about metaphysical grounding. It's not talking about causation. Right? So there is a difference between metaphysical ground. There's, there's a distinction right, between metaphysical grounding and causation. Um, and so I'm claiming that the causal principle is metaphysically grounded in the way things are rather than cost to exist, right? So, so um, yeah, so Carrier is making a mistake here, right? Uh, he's assuming that it, it, the cost of principle will, will have to be cost. <clears throat> and so my view think, does not deny. You know? mm -hmm. uh, yes, I was going to say, I think, yeah, I, I think uh, one, one way to, I think, help clarify the, the situation here is that when, when people talk about like this or that is impossible or necessary or whatever, I think it's important to, disambiguify is that that's not our term uh disambiguate there we go that's a that's a better one uh disambiguate what what one means by necessary because there's different senses in which something can be necessary so something can be yeah. uh say logically necessary whereas you think that like you know it's logically necessary that all bachelors are married okay and that's that's because just from understanding what those words mean it's necessary that those that that sentence is true like in every possible world uh, but that that's sort of like a logically necessary truth. Whereas there are uh, other things that, that you might just think are metaphysically necessary. So not necessarily yeah. necessary in virtue of their uh, the terms being used, but in virtue of uh, just the way that things could possibly have been, right? And so mm -hmm. some people argue that like, um, well, at least Dr. Craig argues that a an infinite number of things can't exist in actuality. What that would be is an example of something that is metaphysically necessary that truth uh but it doesn't follow like once you understand what the term like actual uh, you know like actual world means and infinite means it, it's not that like that sentence just becomes automatically true in virtue of understanding what the term infinite means and what the term actual world means it's in virtue of thinking about that sentence together could it even possibly be the case in the actual world that there could be an infinite number of things existing you know, so, um, the the basic point though is that it, when someone uses the term necessary, I think you've got to specify what you mean. Like, what sort of uh, restriction are you talking about? Are you talking about like restricting it to something that is logically necessary in terms of like syntax and words and logistic? Like that? Are you talking about it in that sense, or are you talking about it in uh, a sort of more narrow sense in something that could actually be the case? You know, so I think you, so what he might be saying, what you were agreeing with is that um, if you think about what the causal principle, like if you just spell that out, everything that begins to exist has a cause that is not true in virtue of just like 
knowing what the words mean. But you might think that that's metaphysically necessarily true in virtue of reflecting on what would be the case if it were false. Or could this even be, you know, could this possibly be false in the actual world? Which I think is different from thinking that it's like logically necessary true in virtue of just understanding what the words mean, you know. So uh, hopefully yeah. that was somewhat uh, helpful for, for you guys, the audience. But the, the basic takeaway is just like you've got to specify what you mean when you say the term necessary because it could be necessary in one sense and then contingent in another sense. But it depends on what you, you know, what, what sort of restriction you're putting on uh, that term there. Yes, that's right. There's a distinction between logical necessity and metaphysical necessity. Uh, although there are, there are some philosophers who have disputed <laughs> this distinction as well. Uh, but in any case, uh, my argument uh, does not depend <laughs> on uh, this distinction, actually. Uh, because um, I, I'm, I'm saying that, yeah, I mean, even if you can have uh, logically possible worlds, uh, they are totally chaotic. Um, so, I mean, we can imagine a world that uh, there are uh, tigers begin and cause around us all the time, right? This, this we can conceive of such a world. But obviously, this is not our actual world, right? Uh, our actual world is not like that. And as I explained in my publications, the proponent of the Kalam argument only needs to defend the claim that the causal principle is true in the actual world, right? To show that in the actual world, there is a creator. The proponent doesn't have to claim that the causal principle is true in all possible worlds, right? So, and therefore, um, Carrier's objection fails. Hmm. Yeah. And the next point is that, uh, you know, he goes on to claim that uh, if the principle is contingent, then there is logically necessary the case that there are logically possible conditions in which it will not exist and therefore does not apply. And therefore, you know, he, and that, he thinks that therefore the first premise of the column is false. Now, as I said, uh, this, is a fault, this is a non sequitur, right? Because um, the, as I said, the first premise only states that the causal, the causal principle is true in the actual world, right? which is compatible with it being false in other logically possible worlds. And therefore, it is compatible with Carrier's claim that there are, logical, there are logically possible conditions in which it will not exist and does not apply. And therefore, it doesn't follow from Carrier's claim that uh, the first premise is false. Yeah. OK. Um, all right, so uh, that's, that's all I want to share on this section. And I want to go on to um, the next highlights, the next um, section. Okay, so here, he says, I showed that we can find such a reason in any logically possible nothing state that these appeal to as pre-existing reality, sun's God. Absent anything to dictate what will be, space-time governed by causal laws are statistically in that in in inevitable, right? Um, yeah, so... Um, that that is uh, his view, but uh, he, his view, as I said, has already been refuted by my modus tollens argument. And in the next few sentences, you find that uh, he say that uh, you know, he he is uh, thinking in terms of being governed by a causal principle, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and will not be. He, he says that it is logically necessary the case that uh, nothing state will not be governed by a causal principle, right? Uh, but as I already explained just now, <laughs> this is, you know, his argument is based on a, a, a false view of the metaphysics of the causal principle. Right? He's assuming that the causal principle must, you know, must be something that governs. You said you know, that view is unwarranted. <clears throat> it's just, yeah, can you scroll up a little bit? It just mm. boggles my mind. Why, why would anyone think that if there were an absence, a, mm. absence of, of anything, that uh, let me see how he how he put it here. Um, absent anything to dictate what will be, space time is governed by cons causal laws are statistically inevitable. Why would anyone think that? Um. Well, uh, because uh, as I said, statistically just now, he, 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 yeah. So he he is uh 
Now, uh, he is almost verifying nothing in, in, a, in a sense, right? He's like the, the nothing is like uh, a substitute for God, kind of, right? That, if, uh, that nothing, um, that uh, everything would, would just come from nothing, right? If, if there's no causal principle governing there. Um, um, but however, no, he, 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 now in, in our debate, no, he, he, uh, other philosophers object to him by saying that no, he's actually ra- verifying nothing. He's like treating nothing as something. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, in this article, I think he tried to deny that. He tried to uh, avoid that uh, objection. Uh, he, he tried to say that nothing is something. And I think what he's trying to say is that uh, if there is nothing at all, nothing, no causal principle, nothing governing uh, anything at all, uh, everything would just come, right? Since there's no causal principle gov- governing that, uh, anything that's logically possible would come. And that's why he, he says that it is statistically inevitable. inevitable yeah. Yeah, no, uh, well, it, this this just makes me think that it, it's a very good clarification we made toward the beginning of the show mm-hmm. that it, it really yeah. does. Cause he, he's almost treating like this call, this causal principle as, as if it's a thing that makes decisions and like, mm-hmm. and yeah. as you say, governs things and stuff. And it's like, um, if yeah, that, right. uh, well, what, yeah, what is it about the world that actually makes that true? Mm-hmm. And on your view, mm-hmm. it's, it's very simple. It's the concrete entities and their powers yes. are what... Yes decide what happens in the actual world and then we you know have these these principles that are that are mere descriptions of what actually occurs and happens in the world mm-hmm. and so just because you've yeah. got an absence of everything it doesn't follow from that uh, yes. at least on your view that you're just going to have this you know infinite multiverse just inevitably statistically come into existence it just yeah. it, it just boggles my mind um it <laughs> makes me really wonder like what what is his view that makes it such the case that causal principles can either be true or false in those worlds. Does he think that there is he like a Platonist? Does he, I don't, I don't even understand what his view would be. Um, I'm not sure whether he affirms Platonism or not. Right. But uh, he, he's just saying that uh, nothing means no causal principles. Right. So, um, yeah, so, but what, so is that, the what does that actually mean? Yeah. So, um, it just means that the causal principle isn't operating, right? As as he, the 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 term that he used, right? Yeah. Not operating. Yeah, but then but then from that, how do you get that it's inevitable, statistically inevitable, that you're going to get a multiverse from a state of nothingness? It just it's mind blowing. Yeah, because um, that there's no uh, principle that is preventing that from happening, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, but then it just seems like he's just like basically stipulating his view he's just he's articulating his view he's not giving a defense of it he's just saying that you have things come into existence uncaused at this time but not at this time it's it's, it's basically just articulating his view he's not giving a view that is uh rationally grounded or defensible or or yeah it just seems like he's articulating a view but it doesn't seem like he's no, got I any think, reason um, to think that that view would be true i i think he is trying to defend his view Based on a certain <clears throat> assumption, which is unwarranted, right? Yeah. So he's trying. So yeah. his his assumption is that without any principle, uh, in the absence in, in in the absence of anything, right? Uh, without any principle governing or restraining anything, a- a- anything that is logically possible would, would just begin to exist, right? So, but but that is based on the assumption that you know, uh, there has to be uh, something. The causal principle has to be something like governing something else, right? And so so that mm-hmm. is the assumption right, that he's working on. Yeah. But it's not uh, just that though. So like. Point, if if that so it's helpful for me to to think about the the causal principle in like uh, chunks so like when there is a state of nothingness you've got like that's that's one chunk yeah i know that's that's sort of like maybe reifying nothing but just visually in my mind it's it's kind of helping me uh split everything in, into sort of two sections so you've got before everything is created whatever that is and then you've got like no causal principle on his view you've got no causal principles in that that chunk and uh things can then just pop into existence uncaused out of nothing because you don't have any principles operating in that that period. Um, and then when you have something, then the causal principle is, is suddenly in place. And you, But I think what, what would happen is, so if, if in the, the state of nothingness, if, there, if it was possible for something to exist uncaused out of nothing, then I think you're going to run into that Rasmussen and your argument as well, is that if that category of things that can be uncaused or can come into existence uncaused, if that category is not empty, then why do you think that it's suddenly empty once something begins to exist? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. You've, you, I mean, overall the category is not empty because you've got a multiverse that coming into existence uncaused, but then you've got to run into the issue of like how many things are, are in that category. It's got to be infinite. And then if it's infinite, then there's no reason to think that those things couldn't come into existence 
oh, when you already have something. So I think that his the first half of his view where you've got this causal principle that's false and then anything can kind of or statistically come into existence, I think that runs into this sort of chaos type argument and your modus tollens argument. So yeah, but, e either way you look at well, it, like I, I already think that his view yeah. is uh, indefensible, but then you run into the arguments and then the arguments are just uh, – I, maybe I'd like yes. to, to learn more about how he tries to respond to them. Yes. So he tried to respond to this uh, in the next section, right? So I, which I'm going to go into now. Right? Can you see my screen? Um, yes. The, the yeah. words I highlight. Right? Yes. So uh, later on uh, in his article, he says, well, he tried to respond to uh, this objection by saying that, so we should expect to observe a why when there is nothing to stop it, but we should not expect to observe a why when there is something to stop it. As there is ordered space time now exists and thus limits what can appear or disappear or in any other way change. It is therefore not the case that if X, then Y, because X refers to a state of affairs that does not exist at Y, and yet it is the very state of affairs that produce X, the subsequent absence of that state of affairs that prevents Y. Okay, so basically he's. Yeah, so then it just. It just... Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sorry to to kind of cut you off, but it just seems like where is he getting this idea that if you have if you have space time, then it's going to prevent things from coming into existence? Like he's giving properties to space time and the universe that like he's just he's just adding that property in, without giving any reason to to think that it it actually is there. Like on on the which to contrast that with the you know the uh, theism with the existence of God, like God's perfection, his metaphysical necessity, and his uh, rationality and everything like that seems to make sense of why we would expect a causal principle to hold and things to be sort of rationally intelligible. Whereas mm -hmm. on his view, if you've just got this sort of, yeah. you know, chaotic, uh, cha um, chaotic, that's not a word either. Uh, mm -hmm. a very, you know, chaos, uh, it, it just, it, it, the universe just happened to exist, just, just sprang into existence from statistical inevitability. It's like, why do you think that after that point, then it would continue to be rationally intelligible? Um, yeah. Just, just uh, you know, adding that property to the universe, it, you you can do that, but it's it just seems like he's just doing that to 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 you know build a worldview as opposed to follow the evidence where it leads. Now his view is that, um, as I said just now, right, he's thinking in terms of. Uh, in the initial state where there's absence of causal principle, an infinite number of possible things uh, would uh, begin to exist. And one uh, among this infinite number of universes, there'll be one in which there'll be you know, this order, in which there'll be things that will prevent other things from beginning and cause around us. And we happen to live in such a world, right? Uh, because we have to live, because if we live in a chaotic world, we couldn't survive, right? So we will find ourselves in such a world where we, we will survive. Yeah, so... Uh, so that, that is how he, he tried to answer uh, your, your concern, yes. Um, but my response to him is that um, I, I don't think his response succeed in rebutting my argument. Why? Because the first thing we need to ask is how can anything be prevented from happening? Right? How can anything be prevented from happening? Now, obviously, why cannot be prevented by something else acting on the existence of why itself, right? Since if why has already exist, then it has not, in fact, been prevented. And therefore, in order to prevent Y from beginning to exist, um, something else, say for example X, right? So for, in order for X to prevent Y to begin to exist, X will either have to act on the conditions which precede Y, which are necessary for Y, or act on the circumstance to make them incompatible with Y beginning to exist. Right? So to illustrate uh, using an, a simple illustration, in order to prevent a moving battery operated toy car from entering into my room, I can, I will have either, no, I will either have to remove the causally necessary conditions, such as, for example, re removing the batteries right, from the toy car such that it cannot come in, or I can act on the circumstance to make it incompatible with the events occurring. For example, I can fill up my room with hard objects such that there's no space right, for the car to enter into my room. Right, so these are the two ways which can which which we can prevent something from happening. Now, however, if our universe began uncaused, as Carrier postulates, then what this implies is that firstly, there will be no causally necessary condition, which means the case that only universe rather than other things begin to exist. Secondly, any difference between universe and other things will only be had by them in the concrete world only when they had already begun to exist. 
and that is before X begin to exist and before Y begin to exist, there cannot be any unique properties of X and any unique properties of Y which differentiate between them in the concrete world such that the universe is not caused to begin to exist, but the Y type thing is caused to begin to exist, right? So since there's no differentiation, they will be the same, which means that there will be no difference between them where the requirement for causally necessary condition is concerned. And moreover, I already explained that the circumstance around us is compatible with the beginning of, say, for example, an increase in strength of electric field, right? So we can let this be Y. And so, no, the, and so these three reasons, which I give for premise one, imply that the beginning of Y, the uh, uncaused, will not have been preventable, right? The beginning of the, the uncaused beginning of Y will not be, will not, will not in fact be preventable, right? Because the, the circumstance does not prevent it and uh, Y would also not require causally necessary con conditions, right? So, so there's no way to prevent Y from beginning to exist uncaused around us, right? If X begins uncaused. Yeah. I, I was not expecting this conversation to uh, be bolstering my uh, belief in the existence of God so much. It it, it really is because um, the, the the response that you gave to to what I was saying before, how like just be, like the fact that we are alive and exist means that you know space time or whatever these things can't come into existence and cause because then we would just go out of existence. That to me is, it sounds similar to uh, the anthropic objection to uh, fine tuning arguments which is yes. i think i think you agree is, is a big mistake uh, it's not even a, a response at all it's just basically uh an observation it is, it's the wrong observation where what we're trying to explain here is why a life permitting universe exists in the case of the, the fine tuning argument and just observing life existing is not an explanation and in this case as well i think that um just because we're observing that we're here that doesn't mean that on your world view we would expect to find what we find in the world. And so it seems to me like it just, it, what, it's, what it's doing is a sort of highlighting the, the explanatory benefits of belief in theism. The theism provides a uh, robust reason to think that the world would operate according to rational laws, be life permitting, have these sorts of uh, causal principles that we uh, want to affirm for, uh, you know, to, to do science and, and everything else and, and just to survive. But on his view, like he, you know, he, he thinks that uh, just because we're observing that we're not dying and things aren't popping to existence, that means that the one universe out of an infinite possibility of, of universes, the one universe where it prevents things from coming into existence, that's the one that just happened to exist. It just seems um, to sort of strain credulity. It's like that, that's what you've got to go to in order to, maintain your belief in atheism it's uh it's pretty wild <laughs> yes well if he, uh, his, his view is pretty wild that's right yes uh, mm. yeah now th th there, are, there are a few more points which i would like to cover actually uh so okay um going down yeah to the next uh par few sentences okay so he says here okay so so even trying to define a principle into being something different from a law he he, he no, he's saying, referring to me, look, didn't escape the consequence of the fact that a principle is either logically necessary or contingent. He submitted that it was contingent and contingent principles cannot always exist. Now, I think now here is another error right, on the carrier's part. Uh, because when I say it is contingent, what I mean is that it is contingent in the sense that it is true by virtue of the way things are, right? And not by logical necessity, as I explained just now. But this does not mean that it cannot always exist, right? We, we can think of uh, you know, this, as I said, the concrete things always existing, right? Um, mm. That there is always a God who bring about the universe and God always exists. So there's always concrete things. And so you know, the causal principle uh, uh, always exists in virtue of that, right? So you know, it, even if it's not logically necessary, it can still always exist, right? And so um, Carrier is uh, making an error here. Yeah. No, yeah, I think that's uh I think that's a good point. I mean, in, in uh, arguments from contingency, there's there's a, an example that's often given. It's like even if you've got a universe that has existed forever, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have an explanation. And then uh, people often bring up I think Leibniz was the one to to talk about the the chemistry book that has existed 
forever. You would still want an explanation for why a chemistry book has existed forever, forever as opposed to some other, you know, literary book, uh, even like a, a fictional book. You still need some sort of explanation as to why that thing as opposed to something else, even if it's existed forever. So, um, yeah, it's just because something has existed forever doesn't mean that it's necessary. Um, it can still be contingent. And so the, the causal principle in this case could have been a principle that is contingently true for all time in this universe, but that doesn't mean that it's uh, therefore necessary. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't have to be necessary in order to always exist, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Although it could be, it, could, it, it still nevertheless it could, could be, be a, a necessary causal principle, but you're just saying yeah. for the purposes of your argument, you're not making that claim so that you don't have to, you know, go in and in, in defend that because it's not necessary. It's not, it's not required yeah. for your argument to go through. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Um, okay. So the next, and, and the next sentence, he says, that's the whole point and the consequence of not being logically necessary that entails that there are conditions in which the thing will not exist. Now, again, this is another misunderstanding because not being logically necessary means that there are possible worlds in which the thing does not exist. But this does not mean that in the actual world, it does not always exist. Right. So uh, as I already explained. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you find that so there's actually a lot of um, mistakes that Carrier is making here uh, about uh, modal logic. Right? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, now there's a, a lot of other errors, but I don't think I need to go through all then, but uh, I just focus on. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd be happy to also do a, a kind of wrap up summary as well toward the end. Uh, if, there, mm. if there aren't any more specific things, I mean, because like I said, we, we could go through, you know, li basically sentence by sentence and explain everything yeah. that's wrong with this, uh, yes. with this response from, from Carrie, but I, I don't think it'd be uh, super helpful. It'd just be mm. super long. So, um, yeah, so yeah if there's any if, yeah. final points that you want to make, and then we can kind of wrap things up. Yeah. Let me just uh, explain one final error before we wrap things up. One, one final error uh, before I give a summary. Okay. So. Um, now, one final error which he makes is that uh, no, he claims that if the causal principle is not logically necessary, then it cannot be logically necessary that the observation that I claim, that Locke claim, that we should be making would be observed. Right. So he, he's saying that if it's, the causal principle is not logically necessary, then it cannot be logically necessary that we would see things begin to exist uncaused around us if the universe began on course. And so uh, he argued that either the predictions that I claim, uh, look claim would follow are logically necessary, or we might not see them. But if they are logically necessary, so so is his principle, the causal principle would be logically necessary as well. Okay, so you know, I'm, I'm reading from here. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, actually, no, again, this is, uh, he is uh, making another logical error here, because he is confounding two statements about logical necessity about logical necessity okay so statement one the causable the, the causal principle is logically necessary statement two it is logically necessary that if something begins uncaused we would observe other things begin uncaused around us given that the circumstance around us is compatible with the beginning of his of existence of those things so no, this, no, these are two different statements, right? But he's confounding them together. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm, I don't have to hold to one, right? I can deny one. I can deny that the causal principle is logically necessary. I, I do deny that, right? I agree that a totally chaotic world is logically possible. We can imagine such a world. But I affirm two, right? I affirm two on the basis of the three reasons which I gave for premise one, right? So those three, three reasons entail that if something X begins uncaused, then Y would also begin uncaused around us, right? So I argue that that is logically necessary, right? If something begins uncaused, it is logically necessary that other things would also begin uncaused around us. Um, and so, uh, you know, Carrier is confounding, right, these two um, claims, right? Uh, and, and so that, that, that would be uh, another error that he made. And so uh, because of all these errors, right, Carrier has in fact failed to rebut my modus tollens argument for the causal principle. 
So let me summarize his most serious errors. Right. So uh, uh, in conclusion, I think Carrier's most serious errors are firstly, he he falsely think the causal principles in terms of uh, something being got no, like is something governing other other things. Right. He he used the uh, the causal. No, he thought it is, you know, he, it is false to think in terms of governed by a causal principle or the, or the causal principle operating, right? Um, but you know, he, he think in, in such terms, but it is false to think in such terms. Uh, as I already explained, right, the, the causal principle can be regarded as a true statement and we can make true statements about nothing, right? When we say nothing, what we mean is absence of anything, right? So we are making true statements about the abs absence of anything. We, we can make true statements about that. And... Um, the other error is that uh, you know he failed to realize that my argument does not require the claim that the causal principle exists when nothing exists. Rather, it is sufficient to argue that the causal principle is a true statement about nothing, uh, just as it is also a true statement about something, okay, as demonstrated. And we know that uh, the causal principle is a true statement based on my modus tollens argument. And the uh, uh, third error that Carrier made is that he failed to understand what does it mean for something to be prevented from beginning, right? So what, what does prevention mean? Uh, as I already explained, right? To prevent something, right? You, you need to either act on the causing necessary conditions necessary for that something to begin or make the circumstances around us incompatible, right? With uh, that something from beginning. And I already explained why is it the case that given my modus tollens arguments, um, the beginning of why uncaused, the uncaused beginning of why would not be preventable right, by the universe existing now and so we would we, we should expect uh, y to begin uncaused around us if x begins uncaused but that is not the case and therefore we can know that it's not the case that y begin uncaused and uh, therefore um, we know that the causal principle is true and uh, yeah the final error of carrier is that uh, he made many many mistakes concerning contingency and necessity which we have already discussed and on the, on the basis of those um, um, false understandings where right? he, he tried to rebut my argument, but his objections failed because uh, his objection is based on um, you know, those uh, misunderst uh, mis multiple misunderstandings of uh, necessity and contingency. So I think, uh, so uh, I would, uh, now we don't have time to go through the other errors, but uh, I will encourage the audience to uh, look at my documents where I explain all of Carrier's 60 errors. I think it is a good uh, logical exercise, right? Because it will sharpen uh, our, uh, uh, it will sharpen the critical thinking, and you, you, you can, you know, can it's, it's a good learning exercise to learn how to detect mm -hmm. errors, uh, because you know, there are so many errors out there among the atheist views, right? So, for, for example, uh, in Pologia, which we talked about before as well, you know, there are also identified eighty errors, right, in his writings. I also put it on my website as well. Um, and so I, I think it will be helpful. Uh, I, I encourage the audience to go through uh, those documents. Um, and the second uh, and the last thing I want to say is that the modus tollens argument has not, in fact, been re re it has not been rebutted, right? It has not been refuted by OP, Linford, or Carrier. And so the modus tollens arguments still holds. Uh, it, the modus argu tollens arguments holds, right? And uh, and the one important thing about that is that uh, you know, the way I formulate the cosmological argument is such that. Um, we don't even require the Hubert Hotel argument or the Green Ripper paradox. Now, I think those other arguments are defensible, but um, what I'm saying is that it is on, on my formulation of the cosmology argument, right? You, you just need to have the causal principle and then you can deduce that there cannot be an infinite regress of dependence regress and therefore there must be a first cause. And you can deduce that this first cause must be uncaused, beginningless, and has initially changeless and has libertarian free, freedom to bring about the first event right, from the initially changeless state and therefore must be a personal creator. Right? So on the basis of this um, modus tollens argument alone, which demonstrates the causal principle, you can in fact already arrive at the conclusion that there must be a creator who created the universe. Yeah, and so the Kalam argument holds. Well, yeah, and that's that's I think why why it was important to to do this show today is because it it does help clarify some, kind of what at least this portion of the argument what it does and and how it works and stuff and then some of the uh, at least some responses that have been made to it and then it can it can help us clarify what what the argument actually is. But Doctor Loke, I wanted to ask you uh, before we before we go and, and wrap things up, would you say that the the cosmological argument, or at least your version of it, it, do you think that the, is that your favorite argument for the existence of God? Do you have a different one that's your favorite? What is your favorite argument for God's existence? 
Yeah, it is not the only argument, uh, but it's definitely my favorite one <laughs> uh, because um, I, I think that the premises are so uh, obviously true and can be proven to be true, right? So I think it's uh, obviously true that something does not come from nothing, right? At, at least this is more plausible than its denial, right? And in fact, we can give a modus tonus argument to prove that uh, it is true that something does not come from nothing, right? And the modus tonus argument is deductively valid. And I think I, I've already shown why the premises are true. I, I think it's also quite obvious that the premises are true. And so the conclusion must be true as well, right? And I also think that uh, it's obviously true that given the causal principle, right, we cannot have an infinite regress of causes. We cannot have an infinite dependence regress. I think an infinite regress is also obviously false. And also a closed loop is obviously false as well. And so, um, you know, given these three uh, premises, uh, that something does not come from nothing, that there cannot be infinite regress, there can be a causal loop, it follows that uh, there must be a first cause, which has libertarian freedom, as I already explained, right? And so I, I think that the cosmological argument uh, is, is uh, you know, so easy to understand. The premises are so clear and can be demonstrated to be true. And therefore, the conclusion must be true, right? So it is a sound argument. Uh, it's a demonstrative proof, right, for the essence of God. And that is why it is my favorite argument. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Loke, as always, it's been a pleasure to have you back on Capturing Christianity. What, 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 uh, what, what are you working on right now? that uh, people can start to get excited about? I'm currently working on a book on natural theology where I engage with the epistemological and theological issues concerning giving arguments for the existence of God. Right? I, and so in this forthcoming book, I show that the cosmological argument can resist even the most radical skepticism. So even if you deny the even if you doubt whether the external world exists or not, right, even if you think that we might be living in the matrix world or whatever, still you cannot rebut you know, the cosmological argument. Right? The argument is still irrefutable right, in that sense. Um, so I, I, I um, engage with uh, the uh, arguments of radical skepticism, showing that how those uh, radical skeptical arguments do not in fact succeed in rebutting the arguments of natural theology. It doesn't succeed in rebutting the cosmological arguments. And also engage with um, theological objections um, from people like Karl Barth and, and others, and Paul Moser right, and others, uh, to show why theologically and biblically natural theology is something, uh, it, it is warranted right, the theologically and biblically, and that uh, we, we can in fact give uh, sound arguments to show that God exists. Awesome. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, uh, as I said, thank, thanks for coming on. Uh, I think this was enlightening for, uh, at least for me and, and for the audience. Um, but yeah, just, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you guys for, for watching. We'll see you guys in the next Capturing Christianity episode. See you guys later. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you you just watched a really, really long video just now, and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?